Hello and welcome to Enquire to Choir. My name is Eva and I'm here to help you, fellow choir people. This is the video where I finally answered the number one request I got on this channel. Eva, could you please do a choir conducting techniques and gestures video? To be honest, I was actually surprised because I thought, why do they want me to answer this question when there are millions of videos about conducting on YouTube? Then I realized, A, there are a lot of videos about conducting, but it's mostly about orchestral conducting, and B, the videos about choral conducting are for professional choirs done by professional conductors. They are not aimed for amateur choirs or people who are just in the conducting role without having any previous knowledge. I agree this video was needed so I'm making it. But the thing is it's not easy for me to make this video. The number one thing, the number one rule in professional conducting, at least in my practice and in my experience is don't show anything you don't have to just show the minimum the bare minimum you have to and make it aesthetically pleasing well this works for professional choirs because the professionals in the choir already know the language they know everything they need to know about their own vocal apparatus and the way the piece should be sung so yes of course the minimum gestures are enough but with amateur choirs, it's very different. In my opinion, the ground rule for amateur choirs and conducting an amateur choir should be show them everything and then some. I am pretty sure that I could land a plane with my conducting, but I don't care because I know that's what my choir needs. So let's start with the video, choral conducting or choir conducting for amateurs and for amateur choirs. First, a question. What does a conductor actually do while conducting? Fun fact, when I say I work as a conductor, people who are not in the music business, in the music world, ask me, yeah, but what do you actually do while you're conducting? And you think it's a silly question, but bear in mind, maybe some of the people in your choir don't actually know what the role of the conductor is. The most common misconception is that the conductor is just waving some things and not giving any information, which is wrong, but you have to explain that to your choir. It's important to answer that question because your choir maybe understand your role as their choir director during rehearsals, but when it comes to the conducting, why should they watch you? What are you showing them? They don't know the language. The real role of a choir conductor is to make the choir think the same way and perform in the same manner. Making a choir a single entity instead of just a bunch of people singing. This person, the choir conductor, signals the choir about everything. And I do mean everything when it comes to conducting an amateur choir. Most people think it's just about keeping the choir in the same tempo. And while that is true, it's not just about that. There is so much more. Plus, while you're doing your gestures, you have to be not only correct, you have to be really clear, really precise and easily understood. So let's talk gestures, shall we? Okay, so here are my two hands, my right hand and my left hand my left hand. Which hands do you use to conduct? Both of them, but you have to have the dominant one, and the dominant one is your right hand. With your right hand you conduct all the time. It works all the time and it's the lead. The left hand either supports the right hand by doing the same for a greater effect, shows additional information, or is turning the pages of the score. Don't underestimate that fact. You need a mechanism how to turn the pages of your score if the score is longer without stopping conducting, right? So while your right hand is conducting, your left hand goes to the pages and turns them, okay? So get it? Plus, if you manage to do this this way, you seem much more professional, trust me. When it comes to the position of your palms, you want to be precise, so avoid heavily opening them. So don't do this, okay? This 
kind of conducting is not gonna work keep your fingers together these fingers you keep together but you bend these fingers a bit and then you choose what you want to do with your thumb i suggest gently pressing the palm against the point finger and in general connecting those two fingers these three fingers are then together so either you do this for conducting okay so this or this but it's important not to have this so you have to have a point with your hand and three fingers but those three fingers should cooperate so you have this this either this and you manage things like that but never have this because it's very imprecise every movement that you do with your hands should come from the wrist and should not be done with the whole palm so when you're moving you don't do this or this or this it's very imprecise the movements are too big there are too many movements but if you do it from the wrist and the, the hand is steady and with your elbow and from the shoulder which is much more precise so this is conducting okay so now i'm conducting it'll be very fun editing this one more thing to remember it should feel natural don't be tight about your hands you have to be very um relaxed is the wrong word but comfortable is the right word plus it's a technique if you have the wrong technique and you're putting a lot of pressure in your arm muscles that's a bad thing especially in the long run and if you have a question about whether to use a conducting stick in my choir culture we don't use sticks to conduct uh, that's reserved for orchestral conducting you do you i don't think that anybody would mind but if you're an amateur and trying to conduct an amateur choir a conducting stick could come across as a bit too much when it comes to time signatures there are rules how to show the right meter and the rules are very good so respect them this is what your right hand does most of the time showing the meter the right time measure for common time or four four meter one two three four and the gesture is one two three four okay so again one two three four one two three four a little bit faster one two three four one two three four the trajectories are these one is down then to the middle is two three to the outside and then up is four but the move is very kind you don't do this you do this it's very important that the first one falls down i will explain why later with two hands it's this down inside outside up so left hand is mirroring for waltz time three four meter one two three it goes like this one two three one two three a little bit faster one two three one two three both hands one two three one two three double time two four meter is either one two one two one two or one two one two one two it's important that this one on the one falls down and on two goes up but it depends on the score for five four so one two three four five the rule is this one two three four five one two three four five six eight meter is one two three four five six one two three four five six or when it's a faster tempo because six eight could be one two three four five six or one two three two two three so you have this one two three two two three one two three two two three both hands one two three two two three one two three two two three okay so we're making an eight i feel a little bit silly doing this like this <laughs> okay something very important to notice for every first every one in the meter i go 
down and I make a point, a literal point. This is the reason why you have these fingers close together because you do one, you go down and you touch a bit. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, three. It's really important to do that because it shows you require the meter. In general, when you want to point out something, you literally make a point with your hand. The first in every meter is the heaviest and you show that by making a point. And you can make points that vary in importance. For example, when you have 5-4 measure, it can be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or it could be one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. So you show that. One, two, three, one, two would be one, two, three, one, two. One, two, three, one, two. One, two, one, two, three would be one, two, one, two, three. One, two, one, two, three. Additionally, one, two, three, four. One, two, three. On every last in the meter, I go up. All of this is mostly done by the right hand all of the time. But when a tricky place is coming up or you have a bigger choir and you want to show them a little bit better, using two hands doubles the impact. How to show the beginning of the piece? My advice is first count the meter for them a few bars just by using your hands. You should inform them about the number of bars for each piece you will conduct before actually starting the piece during the rehearsal when you're learning the piece for the first time. You have to tell them how many bars they will get. Many conductors just start with the last count in the bar, but I don't think that's enough. Your choir members need some time to connect to your tempo and to connect to you, to your conducting. For example, you conduct two bars of the waltz measure. One, two, three, one, two, three. Or you count two bars of common time. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Then they get into the groove and you show them to begin how to sh actually show them how to begin by emphasizing the breath and in this case the breath is the last count in the bar so when you count before starting you do it less significantly like this and then they have to start and they take a breath and you do a bigger gesture and then you make a point when you do this this is actually a sign for breathe point so let's say you conduct them two bars and then they have to begin. You do this. One, two, three, four. One, two, three. And they started in the right tempo. And then you continue conducting that measure. So two bars before the beginning. One, two, three, four. One, two. Take a breath, start and continue. Okay, so now they are in the music. If they're starting all together at once, you do all of this by facing the middle of the choir. But if, for example, the sopranos are starting first and then other voice parts continue, you turn to the sopranos a little bit and you show them the beginning. You turn with your hands. So if the sopranos are standing there, I'm facing them. I move towards them with my hands, but just slightly with my body. How to show when their voice part is up? This is the same as when you have to show your choir when to start singing. You signal with your hands, showing the breath by going up with your hand and then making a point by going down. Plus, a silly advice, but it helps when you look at the group, for example, sopranos, and open your eyes a little bit like this. It signals something. So, for example, sopranos start, alto start, tenor start, basses start. How would I do it? So sopranos, altos, tenors, basses are in front of me. I do this. Sopranos, altos, tenors, basses. Get it? Eye contact is important. You can't watch all of them, but you can watch them as a group. How to show the ending of the score? Two things. In the ending, there's probably some kind of a ritenuto or just emphasizing that it's the ending. So start making a bit exaggerated moves. More strict, more firm. It depends on the score. For example, there is a huge ending and you have one, two, three, four, 
point. So this is the last tone. You hold it and they're holding the last tone. So the question is how to show them they have to stop singing the tone. You do what I call a snail. That's this. I do this and I do a snail and I end it up. Or in fast motion, this. This is to show the ending and this translates to all of the endings of the phrase of the part of the long tone. Always the snail. Use the snail, but don't do this. Collect it. But it's important that the snail ends up because you know, like taking a breath or the last count in the bar is always up because it indicates an ending. How to show the beginnings and the endings in general of voice parts in the score. Use signaling the breaths, making points and doing the snail. Snails and breaths are very convenient because both of them show endings. The breath shows the ending of the previous measure and starting a new one. And snails show the tone is ending for the other tone of other voice part could begin. That's why it's important that the snail goes to the heavens above with the same with the breath. So let's say I have sopranos here, altos there, and sopranos are starting after the altos have finished. So I have to show the snail to the altos and breath to the sopranos. In this case, I will use both my hands because it makes sense to show altos their instruction and the sopranos their instruction. So at the same time, I have to end this one and start this one. Okay, snail, at the same time is, who am I looking at? The sopranos, because they're starting. You don't have to look, you don't have to look at the voice part that is finishing, because the snail should be enough, if it's precise enough. I connect to the sopranos, and then I, okay, so I ended the altos, by like this, and I gave them the breath, so... How to show dynamics and other things okay so this will seem a bit too easy but it's really not that complicated you do everything i've talked about previously but you do it smaller or bigger if you're in the piano dynamics you do this if you're forte very loud you do this if you do a crescendo you could do it by showing with your left hand while your right hand is working her way so crescendo, that crescendo, or if it's a bigger and, and more impactful crescendo, you can stop conducting the measures and show a real crescendo like this. The choir will not fall apart if you stop measuring things with your right hand. They know the tempo. Do this and then continue. So you saw me doing a point again. That was the point. This is the biggest, the loudest moment. So I'm doing a crescendo and I'm making a point and then I continue. Same goes with decrescendo. You do this. That's a signal and a very obvious one. So don't shy away from it. Every time you need to accent something, make a point. And when it comes to the style, the way of singing, if you want to signal them a gentler sound, a more melodic one, easier one. You show it with your movements. You do the same movements but a bit gentler. So you do this. Still precise but just more mellow movements. But it, if it's very rhythmic and very strict you do. Plus you see my face automatically does something. That is also important. At least I think that's important. Plus some additional Eva moves. Um, this is not the signature of mine. I Probably everybody does that, but they're helpful. So three things. The first one, when your choir has a difficult tone or difficult note they have to hold, and the possibility of falling in pitch or being flat is high, I do this. This is a signal for hold it, pull it up. And if you don't believe me that I actually do this, I'll insert a photo now. Can you see where my hand is, how high it is? That was intentional. That was a very, very difficult tone to produce by my choir. I literally made it really high because they followed my hand and they pulled their heads a bit higher than they were and their tone improved. 
this gesture actually works for every tone you need to watch out for, just don't make it excessive. Sometimes in certain melodies where I know my choir has some difficulties, I tend to show them an instruction for every tone. For a tone they tend to be flat on, I show them this. When they have to reach the higher tone, and the previous tone was much lower, I signal them this. That signals come to it from above, don't go glissando from downstairs. And this gesture you've seen for the endings of the scores, that gesture is this. When you reach this tone and I see it's good, secure it. So steady, hold it, hold it, hold it, release it. If there are certain parts in the score where I know the possibility of my choir falling apart rhythmically, in tempo, etc., I tend to leave the standard meter counting and I start slicing, which is funny, but it's impactful. So if I have one, two, three, four, I do one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, because the movement is more precise and it shows to my choir, watch out. We sang Stain alive and that part ha 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 staying alive that's a huge possibility to fall apart because of all the pauses so ha 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 staying alive staying alive ha 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 staying alive it works this seems like a lot how will i know what i have to do and what time it's about practicing but the greatest advice i can give you is think like your choir not like a conductor you have to be clear to your choir. What's the point of you doing all the things right if they don't know what you meant by it? You have to know when you're making certain movements, you make them with a purpose. But you have all this context in your head. Your choir members do not. You have to make it clear for them. You have to translate the language. So explain to your choir what each of the moves represents. If you just show them what the breath the point and the snail mean, that's already a lot. When it comes to your practicing, you should practice alone in silence with your humming. Please don't do your conducting practicing by putting on a recording of a choir performing because then you're not learning how to conduct. You're learning how to follow the conductor by your conducting. That's not the same thing. You have to feel the leading the choir. Try in silence alone imagining your choir you have to get used to the positioning of your choir an additional and the best advice i have for you do it in the dark it's very strange i know but it works because you can better imagine your choir because you don't have the void in front of you plus uh, record yourself not while in the dark record yourself and then watch the recording and then when you watch yourself try singing one of the voice parts all the time you will then see how precise or imprecise all the instructions you gave are when it comes to your music scores color code it mark every beginning every ending every trick you have to use every tricky part you have to go through write it all down you don't have to know everything by heart and You can't possibly know everything by heart, but all of the information are in the scores. Remember, conducting is a skill and you don't have to be a perfect conductor. I advise you not to care of whether some professional conductors think you're a good conductor. If your choir understands everything you're doing and they're in sync, they're together all the time, they don't have any complaints, they understand what you're saying to them and showing to them all the time, then don't care. I could land planes with my conducting, I'm aware of it, but I think it works. So if you have been watching this and thinking, oh my God, she is insane, I will take it as a compliment and please feel free to hit the dislike button. I am very self-conscious about making this video. That's why it took a long time, but I stand by my choices and my practices very firmly and I hope you understand. So that's it. I really hope this was helpful. I wish I had a better recording equipment, but I really hope it was helpful. 
check out all the other videos here on the channel if you wish to see more from inquire to choir you can subscribe if you wish to talk to me email me comment down below or find me on facebook and if you have any requests and you want to see what other people are thinking and who other subscribers on this channel are you can check out the video i made what do you want from inquire to choir and leave your thoughts thank you for being here i appreciate it very much conduct well conductors and i'll see you next time bye